Welcome to Issues in Education, I'm Suzanne Smith. In the next half hour, we'll discuss the latest developments in higher education happening around the state and across the country. Joining me is my co-host, the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron. In this upcoming academic year, more than 1,500 U.S. citizens will be traveling abroad as part of the Fulbright U.S. Student Scholarship Program. This year, 10 of those students are from the Florida State University. We're joined by three of them today. Carrie Gilmore is a doctoral student in organic chemistry. Allison Legier is working on her master's degree at the FSU College of Motion Picture Arts. And Richard Benson recently graduated cum laude with a double major. He has a BS in applied economics and a BA in history. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. So I understand that there are two different types of Fulbright uh, awards, one a full grant and one an English teaching assistantship. Could you just tell us which ones that you have and what you'll be doing with them? Uh, I received a full grant to go study in Bologna, Italy. Uh, I'll be working at a national laboratory that they have there with Dr. Hajiliaglu and I'll be working on a novel reaction that we actually discovered here at Florida State uh, in Dr. Al Bugin's group, and I'll be trying to gain more information about that reaction. I um, received an English teaching assistantship, so I'll be in Macau teaching at a university, dealing with cultural activities, um, helping enhance students' English skills, and uh, in my spare time I can pursue my own research and interests. And What's your bet on how many people know where Macau is? <laughs> Not so many. Um, it's, it's a province of China, a special administrative region, um, and it's right across from Hong Kong, so 50 minutes by ferry. Hmm. And I'll be going to Turkey and the central Anatolian plain uh, looking uh, and to teach and also do a little bit of research on the side in the area of alternative energy in developing countries. Hmm. How did you get interested in these fields of study? or areas of the world, I guess, also. Carrie? Um, well, I, uh, an undergraduate, I kind of really fell in love with uh, science, in particular organic chemistry. I was able to do two and a half years of research there, and I went to two national conferences to present that research, and I just really fell in love with the fact that there is so much that I had no idea even existed within science, and so I went on to pursue that graduate career here at Florida State, and to be honest, the opportunity just kind of presented itself to go to Italy to work with um, this, per this person that we're collaborating with, and I've been incredibly lucky to get that fall, that scholarship, and go there. Allison, why Macau? Well, <laughs> I actually had originally applied to Hong Kong, and um, then at the last minute, the grant got canceled, and I had to choose another country, like three days before my interview. Um, so I, Macau was the closest thing, but the more I looked into it, the more I became really fascinated with the combination of cultures there, because it was owned by Portugal um, until 1999, so it was a European colony. Um, so they have all of this Portuguese architecture, and yet the overwhelming you know, population there is, or Chinese people. So it's kind of this combination of Asia and Europe combined, um, which I found really interesting. And uh, it's supposed to be a great food city. <laughs> 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 I love culinary things and, and trying new foods. Um, it's also really close to Hong Kong, so I, I'm interested in Hong Kong cinema and like Chinese directors, um, things of that nature. Richard? And I too have an Asia Europe thing going on with Turkey. The, uh, it actually started, I just wanted to have a gap year between undergraduate and then whatever I would do with my life. Just sat down with the Office of National Fellowships Director, uh, Dr. Filer, and it seemed like this opportunity just fell into my lap. I've always enjoyed Turkey from the historical perspective and what it's given to Western civilization and what it will when it eventually gets into the European Union. I have a big interest in energy policy, so a country that has a lot of effort in that regard seemed to be right my alley, so it all just came together. So now if you start thinking about this in terms of your future career, w how do you see this helping? Well, it certainly allows you to be a well-rounded person, and it's proof uh, that you are indeed a well-rounded person, even more than a bunch of different degrees or majors could show. And it exposes you to other cultures, shows that you matured, and would certainly be uh, helpful getting into any sort of graduate or professional development. And is that your plan, to go on? I think when I come back, I'll c come back to work for the foundation for the university for a year, and depending upon if I enjoy that, I want to head on to law, just see where life takes me. Awesome. Oh, well, um, as for me um, and my career, uh, <laughs> I, um, 
I also wanted a gap year, even though I'm graduating with an MFA. I just wasn't quite ready to delve into Hollywood and wasn't sure if that was the path I wanted to take. Um, I knew that I wanted to go abroad, and I was interested in teaching abroad even before I came to grad school. So um, the benefits for me are that um, I have an MFA, so I could teach eventually, and this will help hone my teaching skills. Uh, also, the exposure to Hong Kong cinema, and they have a great film community there. Um, and I am a photographer, so um, just documenting my discoveries and building my travel photography portfolio is huge for me, and just having the opportunity to go with me and my camera. And, um, Are you going to have a language barrier of any kind? Probably yes, <laughs> but um, I've done a lot of traveling solo before and I've encountered that and I'm hoping to learn at least some Cantonese to get me through surviving, but um, I'm excited, so I think it'll be okay. Uh, it'll be a great experience just to be able to work with people from all around the world because you, you have that here, but to really go into a place where you're completely unfamiliar and still try and get your ideas across and try to work together on different projects where you have completely different viewpoints coming together to try and solve the same issue it will greatly help when I you know, go on to try and not only pursue a career in research and try and solve different problems that I'm faced with but also in teaching and education as well if I go on to become a professor being able to explain yourself in a way that people from completely different cultures can understand you can really help in trying to get points across to a classroom as well. Are you going to pick up Italian while you're at it? I have started to study some Italian as of as in the last four months or so and I've continued to do so. Hopefully I'll be pretty good at it by the time I leave there. When, when do you all leave? Uh, October 11th. August 27th. <laughs> in middle September for me. And how long will you stay? I'll be there for nine months. I'll be there till middle of July. Ten months and more if I don't get all my travels done. So. <laughs> <laughs> Around nine and ten months as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, and what comes next? As far as... Well, so you, you have this nearly a year in your Fulbright, a whole set of different experiences. You were talking about professional school or graduate school as a possibility. Then do you go off to Hollywood? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, part of the purpose for the gap year for me is just to figure out, kind of get some objective um, focus on my, on my life again. Because with grad school, it's so intense. And especially with the program I've been in, um, you know, we don't get any time off. So uh, I kind of want to reevaluate what do I really want to do after the year. Um, so it's, it's, like a, it's like a retirement afterwards. You've worked yeah. so hard, now you get this. Yeah. <laughs> I think after this I could do anything. But exactly. Um. <laughs> and you'll be partway through your PhD. Will this be the culmination? or? Yep, this will be pretty much it. So I'm working right now to finish up um, pretty much all the projects I'm working on now. Um, and then once I go over there, uh, the work that I'll do will add into my dissertation. Then when I get back in the summer, I'll just hopefully write up, defend, and, and move on. When you were getting ready to apply for the Fulbright, did you, uh, you know, change your thesis based on what the Fulbright requires you to set up, or, or did it, was it the other way around? Um, it was more the other way around in the sense that well, my dissertation is kind of a collection of several different projects, all kind of aimed at devising a new set of rules and how to um, form carbon-carbon bonds in the formation of a ring. And so there's a set of guidelines called the Baldwin Rules which um, predict which types of these closures are favorable and which ones aren't. And so what we're trying to do in our laboratory is try and test the limitations of these rules and to try and devise a new set of these guidelines. And so what I'm working on in Italy is a new type of this uh, closure. In fact, it's the most atom economical and most direct way to form a five-membered ring. And when we learn more about that, learn the limitations and kind of the effects that different substituents will have on there, different things that are attached to that ring have on this type of closure, we can then better predict how it will work in different settings and how to form these types of rings and say natural products it would make towards uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals. Okay.
I think one of the important things about the Fulbright is we have to remember why the federal government puts money into the system and why it's such a well-valued named grant. And out of the ashes of World War II, Senator Fulbright from Arkansas decided to create a program that would help build bridges between cultures, starting with the academic community and hopefully transitioning into more people. One thing I've realized through my term as a student here at Florida State is we're becoming more of a globally focused university. So I see with everything with New Globe that's been built and with the Fulbright successes we've had, we definitely are moving in that direction and I'm proud to be part of it. Have you had other study abroad experiences in your lives? I've traveled a lot um, by myself, but I've never formally studied abroad. So. Not had an apartment somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> had no. to get up and go. Yeah. <laughs> Not so, you know, I, I bet a lot of people are curious about what the rest of your lives are like. Because you're working hard, you might have a double major, you're working on carbon bonding, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're off doing all these types of activities. And so, does is there room for fun in here too, or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for me, at least. No, ab absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, I think the whole nature of graduate school and certainly the the most difficult part of it is balance and learning how to do all the things you need to to get your degree and survive and actually have a social life and um, you know have ties to the outside world aside from the four people that you work with every day mm -hmm. and that was the hardest thing coming into it is to figure out how to have that balance not to work too much or you know, go out too much on weekends or things like that. And so once you figure that out, there's a beautiful balance. And that the best advice actually when I was first here is that this is a marathon and mm -hmm. that don't try and do everything today. You know, it's you, you know, work as hard as you can and then go home and relax and forget about it because it's all going to be there tomorrow. So, mm. Richard, you didn't actually answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I just have a habit of being you know over involved in every activity I can find. But um, when it comes to the Fulbright, they definitely do not want to have the grant recipients, especially on the English teaching side, to be in the classroom 40 hours a week and do nothing but prep it for that. They want us to have a good section of our time in the culture, attempting to learn the language. And part of the grants rules is you're supposed to be an ambassador of American culture to a group of people who only see our country through movies, which aren't accurate indication of our own lives, much less something that someone outside the United States would see. You should have more car chases. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the advice you had for, for the, that was given to you, is that advice you all say that, that people should sort of take when they're, because a lot of freshmen are going to be coming to Florida State's campus uh, this, this coming August. What advice do you, do you two have for them? Um, Carrie sort of already answered with that one, unless you have, uh, unless you have more. <laughs> Please. Well, n I mean, I, I agree with Carrie. Um, my undergraduate experience was much smoother, <laughs> or, or much lighter than what I've experienced here, just because in, in the film school, it's a two-year program. It was kind of like a three-year program crammed into two years. So trying to establish the balance that he referred to was very difficult. Um, but I think in general, y you can do that, and you just have to learn, you know, what your ability, you know, how, how much time do I need to put in this before I go nuts tonight, or, um, you know, what, what, what is reasonable for me. And it takes a while, and it's a bumpy road, but um, you get it. So. That's Go ahead, Richard. You'll never learn that unless you jump in head first and just do whatever you feel passionate about and do a little bit more than what you feel passionate about. Make mistakes, get messy, and you know, and from there figure out what you really are, who you what who you really are and what you want to do with your life. You're part of the Student Government Association and mm -hmm. some um, and there's another another project, World the Affairs. World Affairs program. Yeah. Um, you know, so you, did you do that right away or did you do it gradually, add all those things in? Uh, those are some of the reasons why I chose to come to Florida State when I noticed what the university had to offer in those areas. It's just, um, I, I basically increased my involvement as my four years went along, which is actually the opposite of what many students do. And I find, yes, it gets stressful, but it's very enjoyable when you have to, especially with student government, have to debate, come to a compromise, and see people f for who they are and not necessarily what they're saying. And I think that's a good portion of what the Fulbright is. It's being able to build bridges with people 
people with whom you may have nothing in common except your own mutual human experience. That is the biggest thing when you first come to school as an undergrad is just get involved in as many things as you possibly can. Join all kinds of clubs, do different programs because you're not going to like half the ones you do, but you'll try it, and through that you'll find other things you may be interested in, or you'll meet new people. And in fact, the, you know, most of my closest friends from undergrad aren't the kids that I you know, lived with. They aren't the kids that I were in classes with. It's the people that you were in clubs with that you kind of joined to have these mutual experiences, and you kind of grow like that, and you get to experience a lot more than you would. So one of the things that Florida State has is an uh, Office of National Fellowships. What role did that office play in, in you working towards a Fulbright? Everything. Um, I didn't really even know what a Fulbright was. Um, and then I saw an email actually from the Office of National Fellowships that said, you know, you should come to this meeting. You know, it was just, you know, to everyone in the, in the, uh, the school. And I went to it, they give you more than enough information and, you know, convincing to actually try and do this. And throughout the entire process, they're incredible. I mean, I think I had like 15 drafts of different essays that you have to write, and mm -hmm. they're helping you. And they have the experience in all of this to really guide you through this. And, you know, I had zero experience in applying for things like this. And without them, there's no way I could have done this. I find ONF was very valuable for me too. If anything, it kept me sane. I remember I was in Washington on a World Affairs competition and was afraid because a deadline was coming up that I didn't know about. I was thinking of FedExing essays and the office kept me calm and worked <laughs> out a situation and <laughs> everything worked out well in the end. How long had you been working on this, on the, the application process for the Fulbright? I knew that I wanted to apply last summer. So I went to see them, I think, I think an email had gone out. It might have been the same yeah. email or something. I went to see them just to have a brief talk about, you know, if I'm going to apply for this in the fall, what are some things I should do? I didn't know where I wanted to apply. Nothing. Um, but they were just amazing every step of the way. Like, I could come in any time. They would answer any question. Um, so, I mean, I think the success that we've had or that FSU has had with Fulbright is a testament to them and just the service they offer. Yeah, it really is. The number so. of students I mean, it's clear that the students are richly deserving. And now, <laughs> no, it absolutely is. it is. And now, here's this opportunity, and on a national stage, you get that feedback that, yes, of course, you really are richly deserving, no matter who you're competing against. And uh, that, that's something that's great. I've, I've heard that when you do this, then all of a sudden you have the material to apply for other things. Have you been doing that yet? Not yet. <laughs> um, no, I, I, this has been... Step one. <laughs> this has been step one from, we got this covered, now we'll, <laughs> we'll take it from here. Well, for somebody who's thinking about going into, to try for the Fulbright or going to the Office of National Fellowship, what advice do you have for them? Should they start as a freshman going to them or, or um, I mean, they contacted you, would you say, if you're interested, go find out more? Absolutely. Take because, the initiative. Yeah. I mean, especially we, there was a... Um, an awards dinner actually that they had at the end of the spring for all of the um, people who had either gotten scholarships or had applied through for scholarships and so many of the people had you know four or five t names next to their their name their different scholarships next to their names and it's just a testament that you know once you apply for one Dr. Barron is absolutely right that you have all the information you need the essays are already written you know you have everything already organized that it makes it so much easier to apply for other scholarships if you want to go on to a graduate school or professional degree. Everything's already there and set up for you. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to do. It's, it's wonderful. It's certainly not a bad thing to have Fulbright Scholar on your beta, <laughs> is it? <laughs> not at all. Thank you all for joining us. Thank We've you. been Thank talking you with three of the 10 FSU recipients of this year's Fulbright Scholarships. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Dr. Barron and I will talk one-on-one -on -one about more issues in education. This is not a university presidency. This is the opportunity to take the Florida State University to the next level. We're attracting a student body that can go off and do great things. I like to get the job done. That's really what I'm about. For 150 years, the values of Florida State University remain unwavering. Strength, 
the capacity for endurance, skill, using one's knowledge creatively, character, moral excellence, and social responsibility. Together, these values shape leaders who advance our state, our nation, and our world. Strength, skill, character. Florida State University. Welcome back to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith, sitting with Dr. Eric Barron, the president of the Florida State University. Dr. Barron, we've been talking with three of the 10 FSU students who received Fulbright scholarships um, for this upcoming school year. They all use the FSU Office of National Fellowships. How important is that office to the students and to the university? Well, I think the office is just absolutely great. What it means is that when you have high achieving students, uh, they have assistance to go out there and get the national recognition and international recognition that they deserve for all of their hard work and effort. And the office is clearly uh, doing its job because this year, 10 Fulbrights, we got to announce Goldwater, you know, it, a whole set of awards. It was just great. It is, it is fun to see. Now, one thing that's not as fun is, is the budget. Uh, July marked the start of the new fiscal year. How was FSU's budget impacted this year by cuts? So if you look at the bottom line, we, we lost ground by about, about $3 million. And I, I think it's always funny to cheer when you lose $3 million. But it was uh, less than we expected to lose. Now, the only problem is the, the economics in the state have, have not yet recovered. People are very worried about what the oil spill may be doing to uh, the economy. And not all of that may be recoverable from uh, from BP and so there there is a certain amount of tension about the budget still we've been told to at least plan for a give back of five percent mid-year and then to plan for the next year uh, for 15 percent decrease this would be very painful for a university that's already gone through huge cuts um, how um, how you were saying how uh, that's going to happen possibly mid-year we'll start having a better idea of when that's going to happen or so basically what the state does is it updates its economic projections and from those it derives its uh, forecast on revenues and of course it keeps track of of the revenues so it uses those projections actually it's required by law to use those projections to help set the budget so that it will be balanced you're working on raising $1 billion for the university. How is that going? Well, you know, there's a lot of excitement out there. Um, Molly and I have, have visited 19 cities in, in uh, l less than six months and uh, doing alumni events in the evening, meeting with individual donors during the day, every meal. Uh, and y you can already sort of feel that it's, p it's paying off. So. Uh, philanthropy across the nation was down a little more than 3% this year, and FSU is up 27%. Now, this is, wow. this is good news. Now, what's even better is the deans have all sat down and given their projections for next year, and we will set our target 50% above what we just got. And so this is, uh, this is, this is good. Will you be able to keep up that travel schedule with the fall coming? Uh, you know, I, I hope so, because nothing beats being out there talking to people uh, face to face. But you also have to realize that football brings people on campus and brings people on campus that just love FSU. And so this is another opportunity to, to spend a lot of time with our alumni and friends. This will be the first uh, football season with you as, as president. True. What are you looking forward to most about the, about the games? Well, you know, what I'm really worried about is that I won't get to watch because I'll be so busy talking to people. And I love football. So, uh, but I'm really looking forward to just the pure energy of the, of the stadium. You're going to have a lot of energy also the, at the co student convocation with the welcoming of the freshman students. We are. Um, but you're adding an extra twist to it this year. Tell us about that. We are. Well, we, we want to have a barbecue at the house afterwards. And, you know, one of the things that you hear about so much is that big universities are not as welcoming as small universities. And we, 
we already know, anybody who's on this campus knows how welcoming it is. But we'd like to get people started on day one. So we're purchasing t-shirts that identify someone as belonging to a particular college. It's a lot of t-shirts. And we're going to be handing these out. So at the barbecue, if you're wearing your college, or sciences and humanities, as you're wearing your college, um, any other student wearing a similar colored t-shirt will know that you're music, I'm music, why not have a head start being what, friends. What about the students who haven't, haven't declared their majors yet? Well, so they're discovering, <laughs> and so they get a t-shirt that indicates that they're <laughs> still working on discovering, and people keep telling me that those might be the most popular t-shirts of all. What other thoughts do you have about the beginning of this fall semester? Well, I, you know, one reason why I love being at a university is the energy of the students and uh, just, uh, you know, the, the complete change in what a campus feels like. And so I always consider the summer as kind of a, a time where I'm missing what the university is all about. So I'd be excited to get back into it again. I can't wait. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. That's our time for now. Please join us again next month for more Issues in Education. You can watch the premiere episode of Issues in Education the first Wednesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. That means you can see the next new episode on Wednesday, September 1st on WFSU-TV. Join us as we discuss the latest developments in higher education happening around the state and across the country. If you have questions that you would like us to address on this program, you can email us at issues at WFSU.org. Again, that's issues at WFSU.org. If you would like to see past episodes of Issues in Education, head to the President's website at president.fsu.edu. I'm Suzanne Smith with the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron, for Issues in Education. We'll see you next time.